So I asked Van to watch The Sopranos, a uh, two-part documentary that's on HBO. It's about David Chase. It's called Wise Guy. I love The Sopranos. It's my uh, one of my three favorite TV shows. I, I, I'm not ready to make a list, but it's, it's in whatever. What are the other two? Just, it's The Wire and what? No? Is it, is it The Wire? White Shadow is still up there for me just because it was my first favorite one. Oh, yeah, yeah, Sopranos, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wire, oh, Curb, Larry Sanders. There's a bunch, but okay. say, it's, on, it's on the short list. And I thought I knew everything about the show. And then Alex Gidney did this documentary about it. And it starts out slow for like 20, 25 minutes. And then once we start into the making of the show and the auditions, all of a sudden it becomes like the, the most entertaining doc. And I was just really into it. So I'm probably on the highest end. It, I think Sean's lower. And Van, where are you? Um, I thought it was fantastic. I think that I was able to like... uh take a little bit of the early stuff a little bit more because you had warned me. Because if I'd have thought in any way that I was going to sit down and no disrespect to the man and watch like an hour and a half on David Chase, I would have been like livid, right? Yeah. But it's so imperative that the documentary does that because I was actually unaware of what a biography The Sopranos was for him. And it was, you needed that context. But the minute that you see, I don't, I just don't care. I love this show so much. The minute that you see 10 different guys reading for Chris and you see actors that you recognize, other Italian American stereotypical actors, like every mob dude that had been in a movie that yeah. you had seen past, present, or future trying to read for each one of these parts. And you can see Michael Imperioli there and why he nails it. And you can see the moment in David Chase's head that he goes, that's Chris. The entire thing was like a narcotic. Well, how about they do Livia, the Tony's mom. They yeah. show a bunch of people um, doing for, for Tony's part. Who clearly didn't understand the character, right? Like Nancy Marshall no. clearly understood what they were going for. And it just, you just see how the show could have gone wrong. And it, it almost gives you a little anxiety too. Like they could have made one wrong decision, it seems like. And the Sopranos wouldn't have been the Sopranos. It's like the I mean, show gets you high. That, so that like 25 minute sequence alone, Sean, was why I would recommend this doc for literally anybody who likes this show. I thought when they were shown the auditions, we've seen that stuff. Some of those auditions for movies we like and TV shows are on YouTube. I've never seen it cut that way where it's like, you're just watching all these people and then the person it's like, oh, he's going to get, it's Michael Imperioli, he's going to get it. But the way they cut it, it's like, oh, this is why he got it. I understand. There's pieces of Christopher, just him in that room. I thought that was so fascinating. Have you ever seen anything pull that off quite like that? Not specifically in that way. I mean, I think it's because it was they were willing to kind of like luxuriate in a lot of different parts of the development of the show that most documentaries don't. Usually when you see something like this, it's like 90 minutes and it's cut together pretty tightly and not everybody sits for it. And they just had an incredible treasure trove, I think in part because the show as the doc, like really, really smartly positions is this is the show that changed TV. Like it's something that you hear people say, but you don't realize until you hear Chris Albrecht talking about where HBO was at the time until you hear David Chase talking about how he feels completely unshackled from writing this show the way that he had to write all these network TV shows that he was writing beforehand. Yeah. So you get to see that like in the casting, they get to make different choices. Like the Nancy Marshan stuff is so cool because she has this consciousness of her persona as an actress where she's always playing this buttoned up woman. You know, she's always playing this kind of prim and proper woman and she's been being asked to cut loose and be basically the villain of this show and be this kind of like woman who never gets out of her nightgown, who's kind of raging against her son. Nagging so, Italian. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, all that stuff is great. I personally, my favorite stuff, though, was the stuff that you guys were a little bit bumped on at the beginning, the, the chase stuff, because hmm. it's just really unusual to watch somebody who has been so therapized. <laughs> like, he's been in so much therapy, basically be forced almost against his will to recite his therapy to a camera and Alex Gibney. Like, I didn't think yeah. that the convention of being in the chair necessarily was perfect between him and Gibney, but the stuff that he had to say about how he put his life into that show, and then also in the making of the show, how he forced his psychology onto his writing staff and onto his actors, and this sense that this unease between him and Gandolfini, this unease between him and Robin Green, this unease between people not really knowing where he stood, like... 
him basically being Tony, the way that he led, the way that he was brilliant, the way that he was flawed, this mirror of his greatest creation and the way that he worked, I thought was so cool to see. Um, some of the stuff I knew, I thought you put that well, by the way. Some of the stuff I knew, like HBO trusting Chase's vision and ultimately hitting this point where they're like, fuck it. To make the show you want to make, we got to trust this person, which has been a hallmark of HBO's strategy really ever since, where they're just like, here's one guy, there's no consensus, we're not, there's not six people giving notes, we're just going to trust this person's vision, we believe in it. I thought that part was cool. I thought the episode five, which I knew a lot about already, when they go to college, and Tony's going to kill somebody in witness protection, and how horrified HBO was by that, and they had the two executives, Chris Albrecht and, uh, Carolyn Strauss, basically like, you can't do this. Nobody was ever going to like this person again. You can't have them commit a murder. And he's like, no, you don't understand. He has to commit a murder. This show's about a mob. He's got to do this. He's a bad guy. And then they find this uneasy alliance of, all right, well, the bad guy has to, the guy that he's killing has to maybe yeah. do something to make him a little more menacing, then it's okay. Um, but Carolyn Strauss said, when you hit that kind of impasse with a show creator, you kind of just have to go with it, which I thought was a really cool point because I think a lot of networks would have fucked that part up. Like, no, no, he's not killing somebody. If he doesn't kill that person that episode, the rest of the show can't happen the same way. Um, and then the other the other thing, Van, was uh, Chase at some point could have probably ended the show quicker and made movies. Mm -hmm. And I thought the part two of the doc was about, he kind of realized this was his, this was it. This was, this was the thing he was kind of put on earth to do and to see to the end. And this was going to be his legacy. And he just said, fuck it. I love this universe. I don't want to leave it. And he kept going. But I, I couldn't believe that he had never thought about putting an end on it until Chris Albrecht, the, the executive, was like, hey, have you thought about how this is going to wrap up? Was he just going to keep going and going? I don't know. Those are my biggest uh, revelations. What'd you take from it, Van? Um... Well, number one, I just thought it was interesting when you put his career in context of like when The Sopranos comes out, right? Because you know, like that uh, conceit where the, the the cop walks into the to the to his his, uh, his captain's office and he goes, "Hey, I can go get this guy, but you gotta let it gotta let me do it my way." Yeah, and then and then they turn him loose, and then he goes and he conquers. Like that doesn't really happen in real life, right? In real life. You got to work with a lot of different people. But yeah. this guy was this guy telling his story his way, and he was able to clear everybody out. And he was not a, tele a powerful television figure before that. He was kind of a guy that was on his last chance before he went and did something else. Uh, and he was able to tell his story in exactly his way, and it became this huge, huge deal. And he then seemed kind of prickly to work with, too, which made it even totally. harder. Totally. It did not seem like some of the <clears throat> stuff, bro, I, some of the stuff where they showed them on set, and he's talking to the actors, it did not seem like they were having very much fun when they were talking to David Chase. It, nah. it, it didn't seem like that, but everything about the show that I didn't know, because I started watching The Sopranos when I'm 19, and it seemed like automatically everything was perfect. When you saw James Gandolfini as Tony Soprano, you go, oh, okay, I've seen that guy a bunch of times. It's time for that guy to, uh, to, to, yeah. to get his shot. You know what I mean? Like, that guy's in True Romance, that guy's in Get Shorty. Oh, it, it makes sense that somebody gave him something where he's the guy now. The Mexican. But, like, <laughs> right, right? Where well, all of this stuff had to happen for all of it to kind of work out in this really serendipitous way is just, it's not an accident. Like, it's, it's timing, but it's also a lot of hard work and a lot goes into it, and the show could have very easily been bad. I think the weight of the show and how that became evident to the cast after a while. Everyone thought they were just doing another mob thing. Everyone thought that they were doing some sort of, uh, uh, they were buttoning up the great era of mob content that's really over now, right? Yeah. Like almost an homage or uh, one last gasp of it. But then the weight of the show became evident to them as they read more scripts, as they got deeper into their character as they understood just how genius and brilliant the execution of the show was and what that meant to all of the actors and how that changed their lives, it's like very inspiring. The best documentaries to me 
are the ones that make me go, hey, I want to be like that guy or hey, I never want to be like that guy, mm-hmm. right? That inspires some type of emotion out of you. And it really deepened my appreciation for The Sopranos. And, you know, I do a rewatch per year and now I'm going to get started early. Normally I start over the holly- holidays, but I'm going to do it now. Yeah, that's how I felt as well. It deepened my appreciation for a show that I already really, really, really loved. There, there was stuff that I learned so many things that I didn't know, like little subtle stuff, like the cast reading the scripts were that they, this was the episode where they were going to get knocked out yeah, of the show. Kill? Yeah. <laughs> and how they tried to lobby for him to um, basically not kill Big Pussy because they liked the guy. Ah, get him a season two. And um, even stuff like, Chase that little little tidbit about how HBO called it 6A and 6B instead of a seventh season because they would have had to give everybody raises. It's like, shit, man, he's still pissed about this 18, 19 years later. Um, the Gandolfini stuff I thought was incredible. I, and I've always been fascinated by him. I read it, I read all the major Soprano books and pieces, and it just got it seemed like it got really complicated the second half of the show with him as he was just putting too much of himself into the character and putting too much of the character into himself. And I thought what Van said earlier about how Chase was, or Sean, you said it, Chase was uh, putting pieces of, he's basically like a little bit the mayor of Tony, but then Gandolfini was also the mayor of Tony. So you have three different people that are all kind of the same crazy, volatile, up and down, fucked up person. And they're all steering the ship that has 250 people. I I didn't know a lot of that stuff. Did you know that stuff, Sean? N- n- not nearly as much. <clears throat> I think I always understood that there was this uneasy alliance, this tension between Gandolfini and Chase's creation and Chase's point of view on the character. One, the image of him giving the eulogy at the funeral is devastating. Like that, mm, that moment is that so painful. Awesome. Mm. Uh, just incredible stuff. It's so sad. And there's one other really interesting Gandolfini moment, which is that, you know, that moment when he, it's revealed that he has been holding out in contract negotiations, but when he comes back and he finally comes to a deal, he gives each of the cast members $30,000. But then they ask Edie Falco on camera and she's like, I didn't know that, which means she didn't get $30,000 from James Gandolfini, <laughs> where I was like, hmm, like Gandolfini is a, was a complicated guy, you know, and he's, yeah. he, he's going to have complicated relationships. He, uh, that's obviously one of the, not just like one of the signature TV performances, but like one of the signature character creations. Like you can put that with, you know, uh, actors on stage, great cinematic performances. Like Tony Soprano resonates so deeply in the consciousness of culture. But he and Chase, as open as Chase is about so much in his life, you still don't totally get to the bottom of what it was between them. They, he doesn't totally put to words what their union was, what their what their where their dissenting moments were, like how the fact tormented that is, it was. Yeah, yeah. They, it almost felt like mm-hmm. I felt like Chase was holding back in the interview, it didn't did. you? Like there it was did. some stuff he wanted to say that he was like, "That guy's dead now. I'm not going to say this." But um, yeah, he seemed really conflicted about it. The eulogy had never been shown. Um, nobody, it's not on YouTube. Nobody had seen it, and it's so raw and so emotional, and you could see like. You know, I, I also, I'd forgotten that they made the movie together in 2012. Mm. So it was this guy that he had this crazy complicated relationship with and yet he still couldn't quit him and he decides to make a movie and it's like, you know, I needed my movie. James Gandolfini, the guy that I had this crazy thing. He's Dan, so you good said in that some, movie and I love that movie. I have to say, I've always yeah. loved, since we were working together when the movie came out, Bill, I remember I wrote about the movie for Grantland because I was like, no one cares about this and I think this is such an interesting <laughs> film, not Fade Away, it's called. And it's still like basically ignored, even though it's him doing the other half of his interests. It's him doing 1960s American rock and roll culture plus like European filmmaking styles. Though that though that stuff is all in the Sopranos, but it's all layered underneath mob stuff that that Van was just describing. This kind of end of an era mob yeah. stuff. I for me, movie dork that I am, I love that he was always filtering that stuff into the Sopranos. The Sopranos is a yeah. weird show. It's a really unusually structured and told Odd. show. Mm-hmm. You know, Lorraine Bracco's interview was really good too. I didn't, maybe I knew this and forgot that they wanted her for Carmelo and she wanted to zag because she felt like she had already played that character and wanted to be Melfi. But she tells that whole story about the rape episode and how she stopped reading it. And she's like, why would you do this? Why would you do this to my character? And he's like, just keep reading, keep reading. And that choice and that final word and everything, the way that constructed was constructed 
I thought that uh, her fork in the road moment is like, should she, it's probably a top three Sopranos episode, but it's also easily the most difficult one to watch. I didn't even like when they were yeah. showing the clips from it in the uh, documentary. The other one that I thought was, it, it just shows how crazy Chase was, was he would get these people together. He would throw out their first five best ideas because he felt like the sixth idea was they're like, what, what is that formula? <laughs> Take your first five ideas are going to suck from six on. That's one we'll go. They would write on a whiteboard all night. He would get up, add to it, and then wake up three hours later and just wipe off the whiteboard. Uh, it just sounded like, Finn, we've talked about this sometimes when now in the 2020s, everybody's rightly so trying to be a lot more functional in a work environment and you know have a lot less stress and a lot less discord. And yet you see this show and it's like, this show was a fucking maniac show to work on and it led <laughs> to true greatness. Right. And yeah. then you think like, was that one of the reasons it was truly great? I mean, we're, I mean, we're gonna, probably going to get watered down art because we're, I mean, just the reality of it, you know, we, we're going to elevate citizenry and citizenship and people and the get, but we're going to get watered down art because there's, uh, there's a certain madness that goes along with it. And I, there was one part in the first part of the documentary where you can track the show literally physically with the change in James Gandolfini, right? He like becomes this brute. When the, when the show first starts, he's dashing almost like <laughs> to the, to the degree that he could be. But as the show moves on, his fingers get fatter. He gets balder. He becomes Tony Soprano. The volume but, of his breathing goes up throughout. The yes. Season. I always noted right. that. Yeah, and it's so, almost like, like The Shining with Jack Torrance. Like by the end of it, he's just a, in a fucking bathrobe on a shell of himself. He's just strangling people, right? Yeah. And like there's a, a clip from inside the actor studio where uh, Lipton's talking to him and he starts to answer the question and the crowd starts to laugh. They think he's doing Tony Soprano, but he's not. He's just talking. Like there's a point where, and, and that's another source of the friction, that's a point where he completely rests the character away from what it was before and it starts to become more in line with like who and what he is. And I really feel like that happened to everybody else as much. I feel like for, for everyone else uh, around it, they were sort of in his orbit and they were circling around the, the weight of what he was doing. But like he got a, it got a lot darker. The, I can't even remember the episode. I can't point to the episode where Tony becomes an, a complete total asshole where he completely breaks bad because I keep reaching for Tony Soprano throughout the entire season. Mm. I'm looking for the shred of goodness in him no matter what. I know what he's been through. I know he has uh, mental health issues. Uh, I know he had a fucked up relationship with his father, with his mother, his sisters out there. So no matter how bad he gets, I keep searching for the good in him like to the very end, like I believe, like Tony is outwardly racist. You guys know how I am about this. And it's one of the funniest scenes in the history of the show. The guy is standing there looking at Tony and Tony is being- Oh, outwardly, Meadow's boyfriend. Yeah. Meadow's boyfriend, right? He's being outwardly racist towards him. And I kind of give him a pass. I understand him a little bit. I mean, I, I, I don't. I'm like, yeah, Tony's a racist, but like, I'm, I'm kind of like, oh, it's, it's Tony Soprano because there are other situations where you see him getting along with, it's complicated. He's complicated and more than any other character, I buy into his complication. And bro, we don't do complicated well anymore. Yeah. We do the, either you're a good, we, you're a good person or you're a bad person. You're, you're trash or you're cool. You're canceled or you're active. The complicated characters, we don't do them anymore. And the complicated people, we don't really do them well anymore. They show us the Gloria Trillo stuff, too, in the documentary. And that's that part of that show is as far to the edge, I think, as I've gone with Tony, where, yep. you know, he's so violent and so hateful towards her. But also the show is sort of like this woman is also crazy. This woman is also yeah. unwell. And so that like the show is kind of yeah they're just bad for each other yeah and they're they're so destructive and he keeps but he keeps finding himself in all these destructive situations so it is him really he's kind of seeking it out yeah, yeah. exactly he's, so he's searching for his mother like he's 
you but you get it though. It's like they they've done enough of the groundwork for you to to like under it's like a reverse Luke arc. Like Luke comes from being a guy I don't know anything by the time Jedi comes around, Luke can do everything. Tony actually starts out kind of benevolent and ends up Darth Vader, but you but you 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 understand but and he so was always there's... Darth Vader, I think, is part of the point of the show. We just, yep. it kind of rope dopes us with the first few episodes. It was always in see, there. See, but see, it was always in there, but I, I'm not sure if he was always Darth Vader. I think mm. he had to, I think he had to make a choice as more was hoist upon him. Because think about it, tremendous loss, you know, Jackie dies. There's all of this, there's a power struggle. He had to kind of well, choose. his family tried to try to put a hit on him. I think that his was probably the Breaking him, Bad moment, right? Right, and so I think he has to. I think he he gets a, he has almost a second adolescence, I'd say, during the show as he grows from mafia kid capo to boss, and by the time he becomes Thanos, he you know doesn't feel like there's anyone who can touch him or hurt him. You know, the reason I was always, like, I'll always defend Tony, not that I need, they need my defense, but every, every decision he made on that show, and I think this was one of the things that comes across in the documentary that Chase was passionate about and Gandolfini was passionate about. The decision was always authentic to Tony, the character, and what he would do. And I remember, like, even Sex in the City, which is a show with way lower stakes, had that season when, uh, when Carrie Bradshaw starts having an affair with Mr. Big when he's married mm. and gets caught and Mr. Big's wife falls and breaks her tooth. And it, it was just, you just kind of never looked at her the same. Cause it was like, I listen at you. I thought you were Bill. I don't know. Bad, I thought you were, you? well, I you, thought you, you were you, a different you, character than this. <laughs> Carrie Bradshaw. You, Bill? I believe in you. Like, what, 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 you like the Manolo Blanc? Bill, you on, you, I'm <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 listen at you. Okay. I just I thought, realize. here's the thing from an authenticity standpoint, <laughs> Manolo I thought they did it because it was, a, but I thought, they, <laughs> <laughs> I thought they did it because it was a good arc for the season and not because it was authentic to that character. I didn't think she would do that. And I think with Tony, the entire time in The Sopranos, all the decisions that he made, I was like, yeah, he would do that. Yeah, I get that. And that Breaking Bad was the same way. Like, you understood the methodology behind their decisions. And if you can nail that all the way through a series, that's, I think, the hardest thing to do. This is why Breaking Bad did it. Mad Men, when Mad Men started to get a little rocky there in the last part of the show, is because we were like, I, I, don't, I don't understand what Don Draper's doing here. Like he's mm -hmm. kind of all over the map. He's doing this, now he's doing this. And I, I always felt like the Tony was authentic. Can we talk about the season finale stuff? I mean, uh, the, the last episode, because... Can I say one thing that still gets me about Tony, though? Just one thing. Yeah, go ahead. Killing Chris. I, I guess I get it, but I was still aghast. And every time I watch it, I still am like, that was a hell of a decision right there. Like, I, I don't know if I sometimes totally buy that he would have made just the snap decision to kill Chris like that. Okay. I don't maybe, think it was maybe, a snap decision, though. Yeah. I think I think it was building up to that for 20 episodes. Mm. And he was like, this guy is a bad apple. He's going to continue to haunt my life. And um, I have a chance to just eradicate this now. I think it's because consistent. Because eventually with it's going to be me him. Yeah, it's consistent with what happens in mob culture as well. Like, I don't think that that's such a leap. I think the other thing, too, is Chase was always very direct, even in interviews at the time, that he was like, Tony Soprano is evil. He kills people for money. Like, you do not lose sight of the fact that the, even though you love him and even though Gandolfini is a com you know such a compelling and in many ways lovable character, he's evil. This is, this is, the, this is the absolute darkest layer of society that we are portraying in this movie. It doesn't mean you can't have empathy for the experiences that he's had as a person, but don't lose sight of the fact that he will kill his own family to protect himself. So I don't, you know, I, I never really bumped on any of that stuff in the show when I was watching it because I was like, he's, he's, he's a figure of Satan, really, in a lot of ways. Well, the, the one line <laughs> he wouldn't cross was, he is at one moment, I think the show's called Nightcat, when they had that great argument with Carmela. And he puts his hand up like he's going to hit her and then he ends up just punching the wall over and over again, which Never they show it. in the documentary. 
it's like the one line he won't cross. He even hits AJ at one point. I guess he would never hit Meadow, but that's, you know, yeah. but the, he'll, he'll basically, he's going to, on the bingo card of bad TV people, he's going to do all of the bad things, but that seemed to be the one line hmm. they would never cross on the show. The season finale, um, which came out 17 years ago and now I really like, and it really made me mad when it happened. I thought they did a nice job of uh, framing some of the decisions, some of the behind the scenes stuff of how some of the cinematography they did. But I thought, I forget what the uh, second director, I thought he made the key point when he was basically saying like, this is, this is art. You want people to keep talking about art after it's over. Every TV show just ends in 20 seconds, 20 minutes later, you move on to something else. And David didn't want to do that. And I was like, holy shit, what a great way to put it. Because we're still talking about it 17 years later. I got an argument with Sal about it six months ago because Sal's still mad 17 years later. But uh, has that moved up the rankings for you, Sean? That last episode? I, I, I liked it at the time, even if I didn't totally understand what he was doing. Um, I find it is, the, the documentary does a really good job, I think, of effectively like recreating those final seven or eight minutes of that episode which are so compelling and the way that it's cut and you're sort of like always looking around the corner of the frame to try to figure out what's going to happen next. You know, the way it lingers on the guy who goes into the bathroom, you know, yeah. the way that the door is always opening into the diner, the tension in that, in that framing is just great filmmaking, right? So set aside the fact that we don't actually quote unquote find out what happens to Tony or his family. It's so, so, so well done. And then I think the way you framed it, Bill, is exactly right, which is like, it's still interesting to pick apart and to think about and to try to better understand. And I think that the show is so emblematic of the shift in television to a kind of ambiguity and a moral gray that we weren't ready to accept something that didn't say either this guy died or the show got canceled and we'll never know what's going to happen to them. This was something effectively totally new. And the show was often compared to great novels. And that was like the ending of a great novel, that there was a kind of like... um interpretive quality to it that holds up to this day. So I, I really, really like it. I'm very pro the Mad Men finale, personally. I did it on what with Greenwald on Stick to Landing. I still think that's right up there in the conversation, to your point. But the Sopranos ending, I think, still works brilliantly. Um, I think at the time, I was... I felt manipulated. Because I felt like the, the tension that Sean's describing in the last couple of scenes... Uh, that I deserved a payoff. That after making me, you know, Meadows trying to park a car and all of this stuff is happening, I'm like, my God, my heart is racing. Like something's going on and then it just goes off. I'm like, ah, oh, man, you're fucking with me. And that's something that the show would never do. The show didn't used to do that. It didn't used to fuck with you in that way. And also, I think that the DNA of the show being so grounded in, you know, mob culture and depictions of that, you always get a resolution when you're watching something in the mafia. Somebody goes to jail, Somebody gets killed. Uh, uh, or, somebody, or somebody rats out everybody else and goes into witness Somebody protection. rats out everyone yeah. else. Sophia Coppola's character is mercifully killed. Um, and, like, and so you always get it. But here you didn't get that. You didn't get an out. You didn't get like a, a, you didn't get a, 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 a morality lesson. Like in funny games when, you know, he goes, hey, the minute that like, the guy picks up the the remote and rewinds the TV that you guys should have cut the movie off because you know that there's no way that these people can survive now and yeah. you're just watching to see how they die. And I'm like, don't indict me. You made the movie. Like, yeah. you, 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 you know what I mean? And so with The Sopranos, you're looking for some kind of resolution that's going to make you either feel better about the world that you just devoted six years to or eight years to or worse about it. And you don't get it you get what you get in life, which is, there it is. Like Everyone dies and nothing is clear. Like, that's and Right. That's it. Like, you, yeah, like, it, it, it's, you, you get that, I mean, it just, it's how it happens. And, and they don't bail you out. Um, and so, you, you have to make a decision for yourself why The Sopranos was so good to you. Like, why you, re why Tony uh, resonated so much with you, why you wanted to see the villain win, why you cared so much about his family. They don't give it to you. They don't give you the big bad wolf. Like, they don't give it to you. And, like, at first, as a younger man, I needed it. 
Now, I really appreciate that they didn't do it because that's not the way the world works. I've also rewatched this show. I think I've done three or four rewatches at this point that I really appreciate now how many things they threw into um, that final episode that were either callbacks to stuff from earlier or full circle stuff. And they did a good job in the documentary pointing out like, he says in episode, in season one, he has the toast to the family and the when the the power's out at Artie's restaurant and he says like, hey, it's about, it's the little things. It's th- that's These are the good moments right here. And then in the last episode, AJ brings that up. And he's like, didn't you t- say once it's all about the little moments, the good moments? Those are, that's what, and Tony's like, oh, did I say that? I don't even remember. And you realize like, oh, this guy's been full of shit the whole time. Uh, <laughs> that was great. That I had, no, I had you put that together before? I hadn't put that together. I, I did the, like the fourth rewatch, I finally realized. But it, it's, I mean, to expect somebody to get that in the final episode in 2007 when the show's been on for eight years, like no, no, nobody's going to get that. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, but I thought that was pretty neat. And the, the other thing I never noticed, but he pointed it out, um, was how Tony kept entering his own POV and how they filmed it that way where he kept going in and how like the the stuff that Chase had seen over the years that kind of shaped that. I thought that was pretty cool. It was nerdy filmmaking. But anyway, uh, I thought it was worth, thought it was worth watching. I wish they had interviewed more people. I wish it had been three parts, not two, but uh, for the Sopranos records. Dan, I, I'm feeling another rewatch coming on. I, I haven't done it since summer of 2022. Yeah, I, I don't do I, a full. I, I rewatch in some capacity every year. Sometimes I don't do like a full rewatch, but I, I get to a point to where there's really the reason why I rewatch it all the time and The Wire too, is because there's so much content that it makes me actually you pick up new stuff. Yeah, yeah, like there's, oh, there's, oh, there's, new content. That's yeah, no, you, no, no, no. So what I'm saying is there's so much content when I put on HBO Max. Right, I get paralyzed by all of the choices, and I go. I'm just going to watch The Wire season three. Like, you know, <laughs> my wife put it, she said this before, it's not a new point, but when we were watching the documentary last night, because I made her watch it with me, um, and she was like, you know, really miss these people. We haven't done a rewatch in a couple of <laughs> years. Like, I feel like all these people are my friends. And she said that there's certain TV shows like that where you're like, I'm getting together with my friends again. Christopher's back in my life. And uh, I thought it was a good way to put it. And I thought that was one of the reasons the sex in the city crushed on Netflix. Cause people are like, Oh yeah, I missed these four. Let's uh, I'll run these back. Um, I think that's a hard place for a TV show to get to. What's weird is the Sopranos, one of the most violent, uh, you know, show about an evil character. You wouldn't think those were friends. Same thing for the wire. It's like, this is a world you wouldn't think you'd be like, Oh, these are all my friends, but that's kind of how I feel about the wire too. 